Uh, it's my pleasure to be the moderator for today's roundtable entitled Managing Burnout and Stress with Games and XR. And we're going to be talking about industry trends, work within this space, and also how these themes are explored through narrative and gameplay. My name is Margaret Wallace, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Brooklyn-based Playmatics. I myself am a game developer, and I've worked both at, in the entertainment arena, and also I've worked on games that have a healthcare or wellness component. So um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, with this in mind, I'm also extremely excited about uh, the speakers today for this for this discussion because you know oftentimes when we talk about healthcare and games, we sort of segment uh, who the speakers are. They come from uh, strictly from a healthcare background, but we have a, a great um, mix of panels today who who explore these topics of stress and resilience and burnout through. Um, interactive narrative, and then also through uh, games and research that have some kind of um, healthcare innovation component. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask uh, for the um, ask for everyone to introduce themselves um, and to spend some time talking about who you are and how does your work relate to the topic at hand? Excellent. Thank you, Margaret. Um, should um, I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, I'm, I'm Walter Greenleaf. I'm a research scientist uh, working at Stanford University at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab. I have had the pleasure of working in the field of virtual reality technology now for almost 30 years. I got involved uh, back in, well, more than 30 years. I got involved back in 1987. So as you can imagine, it's it's pretty exciting for me to see how things have really moved forward, especially in the last few years. And uh, I, I work not just as a research scientist, I, I've had the pleasure of uh, starting several medical product companies. I work currently as an advisor to several um, VR medicine startups. Uh, most of them are focused in the behavioral medicine arena, uh, uh, psychiatry, psychology, uh, mental health and wellness. But I, I also work with a few uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, a large insurance company, and, and a few medical device companies. And I guess what I'm passionate about right now, what I'm most excited about is connecting the academic groups to the early stage startup groups, to the larger established players, and, and trying to get everybody to know what each other's up to and move things forward. So and, and with, with that in mind, I'm, I'm very excited to be here with on this panel today. That's awesome. Thank you. Who wants to go next? July, I'm happy to go next. Yeah. Sure. Um, so hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Naomi Wassambili, um, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of a healthcare innovation organization based in the UK called Chinua. Um, my background is in psychology and research. So I started off um, working in research um, in a university in the north of England, looking at um, health and mental health screening processes in prisons. Um, I then worked as a psychological therapist in the NHS, um, providing individual and group based psychological therapies um, and became quite frustrated, I guess, by the restrictions of maybe the clinical room um, and was really interested in how we could support people um, in the community and using tools that they use in their day-to-day -day life. Um, so for the past 10 years, I've been either setting up social innovation projects, organizations, mainly focused around health, mental health and technology, and looking at how we can improve access and we can use um, our digital tools to support preventative health um, within children and young people um, and also within adults as well in the, in the UK. Um, I'm half Jamaican and half Tanzanian. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work um, as well in Jamaica and Tanzania and looking at um, how we can support young people to be part of the co-development process of um, mental health interventions for themselves. So I'm happy to be here and, and share the discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Naomi. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll uh, go uh, now. Uh, my name is Matthew Sagey Burns. Um, I've been in the games business for about 20 years now, mostly in games for pure entertainment uh, as a producer and, and writer. Uh, but a while back, I, I worked at the University of Washington 
um, it, on serious games as part of the uh, Center for Game Science. Uh, I joined in 2012 and I left in 2016. And during that period, I was exposed to not only our own games that we were working on, which were for scientific discovery, citizen science, edu games for education, things like that, but um, a lot of the other work that was going on in serious games. And um, the been invited to this panel uh, today is because I created a game called Eliza, which is a narrative game about computer-assisted therapy. And so it is not a, a computer therapy tool itself so much as it is a story about a large Seattle tech company that decides to get into the market for mental health um, interventions. And um, that creating that game was sort of catalyzed by when I saw some of these demos and was exposed to some of these technologies that people were using um, in the academic field and you know later in, in startups to try to address mental health from a technological perspective. And so I ended up uh, researching a lot of that stuff, reading about it, and combined them with some of my own experiences with, with mental health um, treatment and turned them into basically a linear story, which is the game Eliza. And I think that that's what uh, we'll be talking about, or I'll be talking about today. And I think it, I think it offers an interesting perspective on um, some of the work that's going on in this field. So I'm, very, I'm also very excited to discuss all of this. That's awesome. And because this is a round table, I definitely want to urge um, all the speakers, if feel free to break in or ask your own questions. And then to you, to those of you in the audience, uh, we're going to be reserving this portion of the um, of the round table for discussion. And then the last 20 minutes, we'll open it up to questions, both video and written chat. And so I guess I'll uh, maybe um, ask Walter just to kick things off even further. I know that Walter, you've worked a lot within the, the realm of, of how games are used uh, for various um, healthcare um, scenarios. And I know that you've especially spoken quite a bit around the role of VR and XR and how it is used in in interventions that address well-being and the treatment of anxiety and, and stress. Can you please give us a sense of some of your work in that arena and why you find those uh, those platforms, uh, VR and, and, and XR, promising um, as, as a treatment modality? Sure. Uh, I'm very happy to do so. And uh, I also have a, a couple of questions I'm going to loft too. But let me first... Uh, answer your question, Margaret. Um, well, first of all, I think uh, VR, AR, XR technologies, whatever term we want to use, are not just powerful tools for interventions in behavioral medicine, psychiatry, psychology, mental health and wellness. They're also very powerful tools for assessments, uh, right? Traditionally, we, we've been having trouble with that zone because we, you know, if we ask someone how they're feeling right now, or how they felt yesterday or last week, or how did they do over the course of the last month? It's a hard question to answer. Uh, it's hard to be introspective enough. It's hard to be honest enough. And it's hard to have the words to describe our emotional reactions and our cognitive state. But what's great about uh, immersive technologies, interactive technologies, gaming technologies, is we can perturb the system. We can provoke a response and we can see how people respond. And, and we can see how they respond both by what they say, what they do, and where they look. And also now with the advent of wearables, uh, biosensors that can capture things like heart rate and respiration, uh, we're now having a large amount of data that can come in to help us come up with um, objective assessments. Uh, even the tone of our voice uh, can be useful to help us understand the mood that somebody else is in. It's, it's something that we all do very casually. We can pick up the phone and call a friend or even someone we haven't talked to for years and we hear the tone of their voice and we say, what's wrong? Or, hey, you sound great. So we're finally being able to take technology and use it as a way to do better assessments. Then with the power of narrative story and uh, interaction, we can also come up with interventions that, that can make a difference, improve people's mood or, or shift their attention. And through cognitive behavioral therapy, where we help people be aware of their cognitive processes and perhaps understand how to manage. I, I think in order to help someone manage a, a mood state problem or, or anxiety or depression or something like that, 
it, it's really important to be able to um, uh, evoke a state. If we can evoke a cognitive state, then we can help in, in a controlled manner, then we can help people have the tools to manage that cognitive state. And so having uh, emotions and experiences on demand, um, I think is really a very powerful thing. So, so that, that's why I'm excited about this arena. I, I think we finally have some powerful tools, not just for better assessments, but also for better interventions. Also, as we get better at collecting this data, we can start doing what's called precision medicine. We can start adapting our interventions to the individual as opposed to having a one size fit all. And it, it's just so wonderful to have tools beyond, beyond the pill, to use that expression. Uh, something that is, uh, you know, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, a much more robust and personalized way of approaching. So, so I'll pause a little bit, but as you can tell, I'm pretty excited about uh, the possibilities of this arena. And um, feel free to add, throw in any questions you have. I know you mentioned that you had some, uh, but I can also... I will. Well, Matthew, I just want, I want, I want to say uh, uh, sort of, uh, it was like on, when you gave your introduction, what I couldn't tell was um, um, your perspective on these things. Are, are you optimistic about the power or are you, I, I got a bit of a, a hunch from what you said that it was a critical look at what you've already experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Sure, I mean, I think um, to, your, to your point about like the data, the data collection angle and being able to um, determine people's uh, emotional states, you know, by collecting data on them, like uh, uh, through the tone of their voice and the, and the shape of their, their face and things like that. Um, I can say that one of, the, one of the inciting incidents that led me to, to create this story of Eliza was seeing a, a video demonstration or seeing a live demonstration of a person sitting in front of, um, you know, these cameras on their faces and all the real time uh, metrics were on them and it was, you know, frowning fraction versus smiling fraction and eye gaze and things like this. And it was in the computer vision way, it was like drawing all over their face, you know, and 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 they were talking about um, not feeling very well and all this computer stuff was going on at the same time. And it just kind of struck me in a maybe a kind of a poetic way as as maybe slightly dystopian. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, I started thinking about the implications of data because I think. Oops. Did yeah. Matthew forget? Yeah, please, um, I, but I would say that like, it's important to think about how we use it, right? And yes. so when we, when we collect data like that, especially data that is you know, potentially when we're in a very vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable state, that data does have to get analyzed somehow. It has to get, you know, uploaded to a server. It goes to Amazon Web Services or Google or another place like that. There are privacy implications when things like that happen. Um, there are also implications of like, if, if your Amazon Alexa knows that you're depressed, what are the ethics of it? recommending you buy some ice cream or something like that, right? Like there's a lot of things that come that, that yeah. flow out of starting to uh, introduce treatments this way. And so I think the point of Eliza and uh, is not is not necessarily to say that these things are, are wrong or that we should never do them. It's more to kind of bring those concerns into a real story to kind of to kind of make them feel real to, to make people uh, start considering them. Yeah. Uh, so important. It's, it's really important, definitely. And I think also a lot of the time we're thinking about how this technology can be used with adults. And actually, um, the work we do with children and young people is um, really revealing in the sense that they don't actually know where their data is going. They're not aware of the functionality a lot of the technology um, can collect on them, about them. Um, and there's no awareness of the consequence that that might have as well. Um, and so we've done research looking at how to manage mental health in the school environment, looking at technology, including virtual reality. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest parts of creating or co-creating any digital tools has got to be that the people who are creating them have the same level of knowledge and they have the same level of knowledge around 
what's being collected, how it's being collected, the implication, and more importantly, the interpretation of that, because the interpretation at the moment is so subjective, <laughs> um, and it's based on what we know, um, I guess, from our human biases and our clinical biases, and we're translating that into technology. And I think that it's a really important conversation to be bringing in at the earliest stage of development of any interventions in mental health because of the massive impact and negative impact that it can have on on people's lives so yeah. Naomi I was going to ask uh, as a follow-up to that uh, so I've known you for a year and one of the really fascinating things I find about what you're doing at Chinua I mean one of the many things is you uh, have spent a lot of time educating um, people about what what how the brain is what the brain is made up of you know what the various parts of the brain are and what they regulate in terms of our cognition and what have you so that's just one example and i thought that was a really impressive and, and distinctive approach can you share some more about how you incorporate games and play at various levels and um and whether that's um takes on an educational component or that it's advancing um, well-being? Like, what's your approach and how do you define um, mental health in general um, in, that, in that context? The big definition of what mental health is. Um, I guess for, for us, we see mental health as a spectrum, like many people see it, you know, people can have good and bad mental health and that can change throughout the day. Um, and it takes into account like, you know, social, emotional and psychological well-being of individuals. Um, um, and I guess there's more definitions that are shifting and changing, you know, that the who definitions change to include productivity and thinking about work, but actually, for, for us, it's around, um, you know, your state of emotional and psychological well-being. Um, and, you know, I think that from our default, we try not to pathologize it, especially with young people, which is quite hard when we're working in a world of diagnosis. Um, and actually, you know, we take a very trauma-informed approach. Um, and so we support young people and adults from a position of thinking about traumas they've experienced and actually the behaviors um, and the thoughts, their cognitions and their feelings are as a result of those. Um, and so what we wanted to do um, in our work, and that was in our initially our clinical work was rather than it being about negative emotions, how could we bring joy um, and fun into the space of learning about yourself? And especially for young people, because play is so key. As adults, we, we grow out of play um, to an extent when thinking about our health, but actually with children, it's important. So um, why we focus on the brain was, um, a lot of the time um, with young people, especially if they've experienced trauma, psychoeducation is part of that. And that's teaching young people about um, themselves, um, their psychology, their brain development at that age of different ages. But it was quite dry <laughs> um, and a lot of people didn't understand it really. And actually for us, it's really fundamental, especially the teenage and adolescent brain, because there's so much developing development that's happening. And actually it context contextualizes a lot of emotions and why young people are feeling the way they are if they know about their brains so um we start really basic with paper <laughs> and with anything that we develop we always start with paper and offline prototypes and i think i spoke about this um last year at games of change when we um sort of had an idea around wanting to create a jigsaw puzzle so we created a paper jigsaw brain which then developed into a 3d printed brain which then has developed and evolved into sort of a game and um, where people have to build their brains and they can see the different developments of brain as well of their own brain teenage brain um so i guess for us rather than starting with the technology um we try to start with okay, what are we wanting to achieve? <laughs> and then we look at how technology can be used to complement that, um, whether that's in a one-to-one -one situation or whether that's within a group situation. Um, and so actually what we find is that a lot of the time people really like um, social play. Um, however, COVID um, and social isolation has, has changed that. Um, and it's really changed how a lot of people are working clinically um, with young people. And so as a result, we've responded to that. And that's where you find more and more digital games um, playing a role in supporting the education and prevention. So we, we focus, I guess, on more educational based um, games. And, um, and so, um, so Matthew, I, I'll try to not have too much of a preamble with my question to you. So I remember I was in a really 
fancy schmancy medical um, startup in San Francisco. And, you know, you stood on, you stood on a scale and you would get a 3D image of your body and, and you, you would have your intake with the physician and there was this giant screen that looked like all this information about me that was personalized was popping up. And then somewhere about a year into my association with them, I realized that um, while I had the impression that it was AI driven, um, it turned out there were a bunch of humans <laughs> in the, in the, um, You're like the wizard of Oz yeah, <laughs> in the other room or somewhere else taking notes and then spitting things back on the display for the physician to read to me. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like that was an interesting ethical consideration that I wasn't completely aware of. And I feel like you explore these themes around, um, AI driven sort of uh, therapies and the human in and how we humans become interfaces for these telemedicine experiences. And you even spoke with counselors, I believe, to, mm -hmm. to write the narrative and, and, and create the narrative. Can you speak to what that process was like and, and, and how you explored some of those themes or other related themes in general? Certainly. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a lot there to get into. Um, I'll start with, I guess, the, the counseling, uh, the counselors that I spoke to, um, many of whom, uh, do cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, CBT is, is one of the most popular forms of, of therapy. It's one of the most studied forms of, uh, mental health therapy. And because, uh, CBT is very, uh, codified and, and well-defined, uh, as a series of interactions that you can have, um, CBT is also very popular in, in computer assisted therapy because often there's like a, a script that you can follow, you know, like if they, if they say, if they make this assertion, then you challenge it in this way and, and so forth. And so, um, one of the things that people say about CBT, uh, even, even when, the practitioner is another human being is that sometimes it can feel a little bit rote it can feel like your therapist is is just kind of like moving down this checklist of things instead of really listening to you um, and i think that that's something that computerized therapy also runs the risk of especially when um it's kind of clear that the computer is not actually understanding you and there's either this like wizard of oz style system that you're talking about or some other kind of intersection of like the AI is not really understanding you as much as it maybe wanted you to think. Um, the the startup that you that you mentioned working at wouldn't be the only uh, tech startup that has sort of misrepresented the level of you know how much the AI really knows. Uh, and as part of my research, I, I downloaded a bunch of um, mental health support like chat bots and things like that, uh, which are getting more and more com common in the app store. I think talking to these chatbots after a while, it's very clear that they don't really, they don't understand what you're saying at all, but it's, they, they never really are honest about that. Um, I, I've, I noticed that a lot of these kinds of like mental health interventions try to pretend that they really do understand you. And that's something that comes up in the game with the intersection of these people coming in for help, and then the computer response that you get is kind of, sometimes it's appropriate and works and seems to help them. Sometimes the response clearly indicates that the system didn't understand what the person said and is and is not a good response. And I think anyone who's interfaced with, you know, any kind of system like that has had a moment like that where it clearly didn't get what you were trying to say. Um, so it was important for me to depict it both working and not working in this story and as you progress through the game you you see it help some people and you and you see it kind of misfire uh in other situations and then the the thing that i think you, you were mentioning about the the intersection with people the conceit of the game is that you are reading these responses from an ai to a patient and that's kind of like a a gig economy job that you can get which is to to act like a therapist, but you're not licensed as a therapist. So an AI just tells you to say this to people to provide some sort of human touch. That's a, that's a little bit of my, you know, fictional license coming in uh, to, to the story, but I think it, it helps put you in the situation of having to tell someone this thing that, that maybe 
helps them or maybe doesn't, but doesn't necessarily put you in the driver's seat of choosing what to say to them, yeah. which is another thing that you, um, to, to get into about like where choice comes in with this game. I, I'd be curious, uh, Matthew, uh, uh, I think you're, you're so right about the, the downside and the problems that are there. And I, I think it's not just in, in terms of the evolving systems that are out. I think right now, the fact that we can take a lot of the data that's on, well, interactions like this or in some of the multi-user virtual online games that we play, now with machine learning, we can use that as a way to score or tag someone with a certain uh, predilection for a diagnosis. And so this issue of data being harvested and used in a, in a way that against us is, is, is there not just in the clinical context, but really in the real world context too. And as we know, that's always a big issue with, uh, with facial recognition of some of the other dystopian systems that are evolving out there. Uh, but I also feel that um, a good defense is an offense. So I'm, I'm curious as you were researching and designing your system, um, did you come across any anything that maybe your your next project might be inspired to do that you think could be um, uh, a, some? How would you do it? I guess is the question. Uh, uh, what, what, mm. You know, now that you've had a chance to explore where it can go wrong, <laughs> what, what do you envision as how it could go right? I think you know the biggest the biggest takeaway that I that I that I had from from sinking into all of this and and creating this story and creating this game is that. I would, I would like my mental health tools to be honest with me, and for mm -hmm. everything to just to for for me to understand what I'm actually doing when I'm talking to a bot or a real person, even um, understanding where you are in the process. And I think that that's you know that's a that's a huge thing in in all medical situations, right? Which is which is letting the patient feel empowered to, to understand that they're choosing the care that they're getting and, and all of those types of things. And I think in the realm of like mental health and interventions for mental health, that includes understanding how the program works. That includes understanding that they're talking to an AI that maybe doesn't actually, it doesn't actually know what they're saying. It just can tell that they're distressed and it's suggesting things based on that. You know, I think that even having something that you know is is fake and this comes up um this comes up in the game as well like sometimes you can feel better even talking to something that you know doesn't understand you um people compare it to like you know you can talk to your dog and feel better after it doesn't mean your dog knew what you were saying um so the possibility that a virtual agent could you know like your dog maybe seem to understand you but not really understand you would make you feel better um, that's fine, but I also know that it's my dog. You know, it's not it's not my dog pretending to be like a licensed clinical therapist. It's yeah. not my dog is not uploading my data to to Amazon or yeah. Facebook or so. You know, it, it's, I think it's just being aware of those those types of things and and putting the the power in patients to to control their experience and understand what they're doing when they're interfacing with these types of technologies. Well, Naomi and, and Matthew, I think what the approach you're taking is so so important. Uh, you know, my 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 colleague uh, Jeremy Balenson wrote a book about VR called uh, Experience on Demand, but I think it goes beyond that too. I, I think the power of uh, VR, AR, XR, and gaming technologies is it can be story on demand. Mm -hmm. And healthcare is difficult. Healthcare is arduous, and healthcare is scary, and healthcare can be extremely frustrating, but leveraging the tools that, that that you've used Naomi and that you've used Matthew to engage people and have them be a participant in, in their own journey. I, I think that's such a powerful way to to make uh, the difficult journey of healthcare more palatable. That story is, story is such a powerful way, especially in the mental health arena. And, uh, you know, and the theme of this, uh, this session is on uh, burnout and stress. And you know, if you're burnt out and you're stressed, then having something be dishonest, as you described, Matthew, or 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 not working very well, is just going to be even more stressful. So I, I think I think the approach you're both taking is so cool. Yeah, thank you. And I think just to echo that as well, Matthew, we um, at the start of um, lockdown in the UK, um, we were commissioned um, by a local authority, but also by um, the UK government to develop a national platform for young people's mental health. Um, and it's called NeuroLove. 
Org because we wanted a space online where young people could experience love and it wasn't about like how to manage our anxiety with COVID um, but a lot of the feedback we had was people wanted a human um, they wanted a human interaction um, on the chat and not a bot and so what we did was we rapidly trained a range of social therapists um, to provide a mixture of psychological education based on CBT but also narrative support and social support as well um, and what we've been able to do is look and tag at some of the interactions as well and explore some of the interactions and how that works and um, how young people are developing interest with some of our therapists online in different ways and specifically young people who we work with who um, are in care or foster care as well um, so have been quite excluded from I guess traditional therapies um, and accessing them and don't have parents at home to be able to sort of support them as well so it is so important I think to feel that there's a human, um, having human to be able to just be able to pick on some of the different um, elements. And I, I don't think we, we haven't got there yet because we all interpret interactions in a very different way. Um, and we're complex beings, which is the most amazing part of who we are. Um, but I think it's so important um, that we keep reiterating um, this same message um, because there's just not enough research that's showing um, that the bots are at the level of humans as of yet. <laughs> Congratulations on Neuro Love, by the way. I've seen so many things about it. Um, it seems like it's grown quite a bit. Yeah, it was quite rapid. So we had the idea in March. It was built and implemented in April. Um, and now it's been scaled nationally. So um, I think it's the first time that interventions moved so quickly um, in healthcare um, that I've ever worked on in my whole entire life. So I think that's one thing that I guess COVID's brought out. It's meant that um, the risk um, and the fear that a lot of people had around technologies um, has sort of disappeared. Um, however, alongside that also are some of the securities and the concerns and, and um, the ethics around some of the tools that are used as well. Um, and because things are moving so quickly, um, it's really important, I think, for us as developers and for us as people who are creating these interventions about um, the security and the ethics of the tools that are being created. Um, because now, um, and I guess everybody's seen this more time than ever, everybody is happy to share their life online. Um, but does that mean it's right? <laughs> um, and is that safe? <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Walter, uh, I, I have so many questions I want to ask all of you. It's And we, we only have a few more minutes before we move into the Q&A, which I'm also looking oh, no. forward to. Um, so Walter, one of the things that you've, one of the many things that you talk about that uh, I felt really was inspirational and really opened my eyes was how you describe your work with XR and how it can be used as a tool to uh, reflect one's future self and how that can be used as a means, at least in this instance, to potentially address issues around um, well-being. Can you please mm -hmm. speak to that? I think it's exciting. So do you mind sharing your thoughts on that? Sure. Well, one of the research projects at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab was to understand how the, the power of the avatar for shaping our behavior and especially the powerful the power of an avatar of our future self. One of the problems we have as we go through life is realizing the consequences of our actions, uh, how our diet, how our exercise, how our sleep, how our behavior, how our use of uh, um, alcohol and nicotine and uh, substance of abuse can affect our future because we don't see it. And we're very much in the moment, which is often a good thing. But one of the projects we did was to create avatars of one's future self. Now, it takes a little bit of time to bond with your avatar. You can't just make a representation of yourself and, and connect with it. But there are some things, there's some processes that you go through. And the term that was uh, developed uh, in our research lab um, uh, under Jeremy Balanson was the Proteus effect. And once you connect with your avatar and you you wave in the virtual mirror and your avatar, your future avatar waves back. And I wish I could show you some visuals of it because it's it's sort of it's sort of clear the concept. Once you connect with your future avatar, then you can have a dialogue with your future self and understand how uh, your behavior can. Um, and just to be sort of specific about the experiment we did, we gave some cash to some Stanford undergraduates. And we said, you can do whatever you wanted to with the cash. 
And we also gave them a link to a retirement account that they could put some money into. And the, the, the students who had a chance to get to know their future self and think about their future put money into the retirement account, whereas uh, the ones who were just given cash were, were not so inclined. And we've replicated um, that process with things like exercise and nutrition, et cetera. And it's been replicated by other research groups too. So what I think would be really fun is to have something that maybe is geosensitive. And if you're trying to cut down on your use of alcohol, um, whenever you started to walk into a bar, maybe your phone would ring and your future self would be there looking like you, but maybe 30 years older and maybe not looking so happy and, or, or maybe some other things that you need to do to motivate yourself. So that connection of having empathy with yourself I think can be a very powerful and closing the feedback loop too, so that you can see the consequences of your decisions and your behavior uh, more immediately. That resonates so much with me. I just, I can't even begin to describe how many ways, uh, you know, I think back when I was 13 and 14 and I thought I was invincible and, um, but having that kind of tool at, to work with, to really have, um, some of those understandings sort of baked in more through that experience, I, I think it would have been so helpful for so many people in so many different contexts. Um, and speaking of which, um, so Matthew, uh, and forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth, so feel free to contradict me if I have any of this wrong, but I believe that some of the inspiration for Eliza, and I think this probably came up earlier, was uh, your experiences working in the tech industry and as somebody who's been in the tech industry myself for 20 years and how you know uh one of the early mantras of one of my first startups after they handed us a copy of the fountainhead said or atlas shrug excuse me said uh you'll sleep when you're dead and there was that kind of mentality of crunch culture and especially within the video game industry i mean crunch mm -hmm. is sort of a badge of honor a medal of of, of honor to have um and so, so can you please talk about um, how that's re reflected in, in Eliza? And also just as a bit of editorial, don't you think it's ironic that we have a lot of these sort of mindfulness apps and games and um, focus games that come from an industry that generally um, operates kind of on the opposite end of that spectrum in terms of crunch and, um, you know, 60, 70, 80 hour work weeks and, um, just, just general things around that. What do you For think? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the games industry, especially the, the entertainment focused games industry is, is quite notorious for its, uh, crunch culture. Um, there have been some exposés on that recently, although, you, you know, whether, whether it will really change, uh, meaningfully is, is still, I think, open to, uh, to debate and we'll see if that happens. Uh, but and certainly in my early years in the game industry, I just didn't know better, and so I went along with it. And I, um, I think I, I definitely harmed my physical and mental health uh, by doing that, and uh, learned a kind of a harsh lesson in the process by by actually just going through it. You know, I, I just didn't have the the tools to understand why I was doing uh, the things that I that I was I didn't have a future avatar to talk to, to, to tell me, you know, to take it easy. Um, and so uh, coming through that other side of that experience, you know, there was a, um, there was like a, a burnout period and a, and a, you know, stressful, the, it's a stressful atmosphere and there is burnout on the other side of that. And so certainly those, those feelings uh, also went into the game, Eliza. It's, uh, it's because it's a, story uh i was able to give the the main character of this story a similar a similar background who worked in tech and who was burnt out by that uh experience i think that moving forward you know it's just going to be it's going to be very important to we, we talk about in games we talk about like sustainable development like development that you can that you can do without um without killing yourself uh but but again it because the uh, pressures are so high, it's hard to, you know, it's, it, it often just comes down on the side of we just have to get through it and, and work harder. And so um, I think it is ironic that sometimes the very solution that, you know, the purported solution to some of this 
kind of stuff comes from, if not the exact same company, the kind of culture that is uh, creating uh, these these pressures in the first place. And that's a whole other, you know, that's a whole other question about like the the system that that creates the situation that then needs to produce the the solution for the situation that it kind of created in the first place. Um, I think it's it's most uh, concerning to me when it's like used as when when some when things like apps for for mental health are used as kind of a a way to say for for large institutions to say okay we did something about the problem uh, you know if you're like a if you're a new college undergraduate for example they'll your your college will just say by the way we have this app you can use install that right and then they can say well we did something right. Um, but they didn't necessarily do anything to change the kind of the 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 way uh, academic pressure works or any you know any like larger systemic change. It's always like we kind of like oh well we threw this app at you. It's it's free. You know we made it free for you. Mm -hmm. And so I think we just have to be careful that those kinds of things aren't just used as like little band aids to be able to get out of doing you know thinking about things in a deeper way. Yeah. Absolutely. Did anyone want to add to that? Um, yeah, I think I completely agree. I think it, it comes down to, I guess, the, I talked about the pathologizing mental illness, really, and mental health apps have become about mental illness and solving one specific um, diagnosis. Um, and usually it's fo focused on common mental health problems, so anxiety or low mood, and sleep is the, the, the topic that's probably the hot topic because it's easy, there's less stigma attached, and you know there's quite clear CBT protocols around sleep interventions. However, when we look at mental health, it is our emotional and it's our social environments. Um, and and, you know, there's limited, I guess, interventions or support that are thinking about the social con and environmental context in the way and the places people are living and people are working. And that's actually the truly difficult conversation. Um, you know, like you say, at the moment, it's easy to provide or prescribe an app um and we're getting good at that <laughs> um but actually when we start to look at the the evidence and the clinical evidence around that and um, we're seeing that it's not necessarily especially in certain diagnoses having the impact that that we want to have um and i think that you know in workplaces you're completely right and we um developed a service called talk and teleport where we use vr alongside um talking therapies um, and a lot of the conversations are around what's happening at work and also family life as well um and people being able to bring their home self into work and, and what that looks like and you know there's cultural and pressure and demand and i think that the difficulty or the danger is these tools become productivity tools as opposed to therapeutic tools um and that's something we've got to i guess be be very mindful of yeah yeah, I, I think I think you're absolutely right, uh, Matthew and Naomi, about the the concerns and dangers. But but I also should point out uh, the, that we have really made a lot of progress just in the last short while of accepting that we can leverage technology to to improve health and wellness. And yes, yeah. there there are some bit mistakes and things that haven't been done right, but so much better than just saying, okay, here, try this pill check back in a few months and and we'll see if you're not worse maybe we'll continue with it and you know we're, we're getting so much better at things that are not drug based that are based on teaching wellness skills etc and yes we have to be clever at how we do it and not be lame and not be stupid and and be respectful of people's privacy i think we can do that and and i just think it's so great that you know the technology is in a position to address some of the problems that we have not had great solutions for before. Mm. And, uh, you know, and it's not just in the mental health space. There's problems like traumatic brain injury or stroke and chronic pain. And, and we're finally starting to have some powerful tools that can help us with these irascible, horrible problems. So mm. we've got to do it right. And we have to leverage what our, our colleagues in the gaming industry know as ways of promote uh, adherence and, and joy of doing these things, but but we finally have some powerful tools that we can use. Absolutely, so I want to make sure that everyone in the audience, you are welcome to ask questions uh, right now, it's beginning, and so you can ask uh, either through the session chat your question, or if you hit the uh, share video and audio button, you can ask your question via that means. Um, 
And so I'll ask another question, um, unless anyone else, any of the panelists have a question that they want to throw out. Um, so uh, I guess, what is what are some of the methodologies that you use to test with your target demographic? Um, so I know, Naomi, you've worked a lot with teens to, to design your programs. Can you please talk more about that? Yeah, so um, one of the things we always do is we co-develop um, and so we train up young people. It might be in areas of UX, it might be in areas of research so they can contribute, I guess, in an equal playing field. And we also pay them as well. Um, so they're not volunteers um, to contribute to the development of each of the tools. So we go through um, like a design sprint process um where we work with different groups and different stakeholders whether that's young people of certain ages whether that's social workers and um, whether that's parents and um, to think about what their needs are in the first instance um then we how people can access things so in, obviously in the covid situation the majority of people were in their homes we did have some people who had access to smartphones who had access to tablets there were other people who completely didn't have any access and didn't have any data or reception as well so we had to look at the sort of like not our tool not exacerbating the digital exclusion um I guess gap which is already there as well um and then looking at what we wanted to do so we have different outcome measures around um well-being so we use different measures like strengths and difficulties or the patient health questionnaire or the general anxiety so the questionnaire to look at anxiety low mood and um, but we also do a lot of conversational and narrative based work um, and we get feedback from what young people are saying and um, how they're saying things um, and we reiterate that back to them as well but we, you know they're, they're aware of what we're collecting and we give them insights into what we've picked up um, from that process and then then we start the development of it and the digital development of it so we'll start to build um, the tool and throughout that process we'll be continually getting feedback um, from the group so young people in this case um, around what that looks like so even with the Neurolove platform which is an online platform so um, people can access psychological therapy social therapy they can go to live classes um, they can access a range of different resources on there and um, what it looked like in April is very different to what it looks like now um, and that's because we've just been quite agile and been we've been adapting it in line with the feedback that we've got and I think that that methodology works really well um, because everybody on the team is um, there's a bit of humility so it's all right because they're expecting things to change um, and also the core is just about listening um, and looking at how people are using um, the sites how they're interacting with different things um, and then changing it and just testing it really as well so I guess it's just a constant test um, and and making sure we've got really clear feedback channels for, for young people and um, but it ranges because our it's for 8 to 25 so that age range is so big <laughs> um there's completely different needs for a 22 year old to what there is to a 10 year old as well um and that's been something that's been quite difficult when we're trying to get this one size fits all um approach out there so i think we're we're always learning um and that's how we're bringing like more games and more um games into the interventions that we're providing for especially younger um younger people that we're working with so so Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and Walter, I, I think you probably saw this question for you from Justin Chow. In one of your presentations, you mentioned the possibility of biomarkers to collect more data for XR gear. Can you explain this and the challenges to, in, what those challenges to introduce them are? Especially in the context of FDA approving the prescription of games for various treatments, it's promising. Okay, well, there, there's a couple questions embedded in that overarching question in terms of uh, the, the way we're leveraging the ability to collect biosignals. Uh, we collect that in a variety of ways. There's, there's wearables that you can wear, uh, and we are, on our, we are already doing some of that with our wrists and, and smart watches. There's hearables that have um, biosensors built in for oxygen levels and for and from that and heart rate and respiration there's headbands we can wear while we sleep that collect a, a whole variety of information including eeg and we are there are companies building inserts that can go into an hmd that will collect these biosignals 
and many companies already have systems that track uh, um, pupil direction and gaze and pupil dilation. So there's so much information we can get. And then the challenge is making sense of that data and correlating. And I, I, there are there are initiatives to come up with a library. And um, one of the publications that's listed in the link I sent out is um, a study we did correlating evocative virtual environments with MRI um, imaging of the brain's response so we can understand how you can use um, VR to evoke an emotional response. I think we need for research purposes and also for clinical purpose, care purposes, we need a library of culturally diverse evocative virtual environments that can be used to, to generate uh, an experience for people, a mood for people for diagnostic purposes and also for interventional purposes, but they need to be culturally diverse, age appropriate, and they need to be linked to the psychophysiological data so that we can uh, you know, untease all of this. So we're really just at a beginning spot, but um, but we now finally have some powerful tools to understand the connection between our moods and our bodies and our cognitive processes to do both a better job of diagnostics, which is critical because we don't want to send people down the wrong pathway, to personalize the approach so we can make sure that we're not doing a one-size-fit-all approach for everybody, and, and to leverage uh, research so that we can make sure we're doing it right. So it's it's it all gets woven together. That that's excellent, and I know there are some questions uh, in the chat around. Uh, you know, it's interesting as somebody who comes from the games industry, from the entertainment world, similar to Matthew, and then I've kind of, and and then to explore these various themes, it's kind of a a new thing in some ways in our industry. Um, one of the questioners asked uh, if there's a resource for. Uh, game developers or people who work in the games industry to collaborate more with um, scientists and healthcare practitioners. And I will say there are various directories out there that I know of, but I don't know anything. Um, there is Game Dev Map, that is definitely a good um, URL, but I don't think there are specific, and there are probably lots of directories around impact um, developers, but I don't know if there's anything that I would say is the go-to. Uh, I, I would imagine the panelists may agree. Um, otherwise, okay. as far as I know, I mean, Games for Change, this this event is, is uh -huh. the, the biggest one in terms of uh, games for, for making, you know, applying game technology to making a positive impact um uh on on the world i think if you follow kind of just the conference proceedings in general you, you'll get a, a a decent view kind of overview of the space um and then can follow from there i'm not sure if there's yeah an integrated online resource that really lays it all out but it is well there's the it's a it's oh, a, go ahead Matthew. it's a field that's kind of changing constantly too so I, th I think just kind of like staying on top of 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 games for change itself, I think is a, is a great way to go. There's also the International Virtual Reality Healthcare Association. Uh, we have an annual meeting that's focused on healthcare and VR and XR technology. Uh, we put on last year in collaboration with the National Mental Health Innovation Center, a, a workshop specific to VR and AR uh, XR technologies for mental health. Uh, that was in Denver last, uh, uh, last fall. Um, so there's a number of industry associations. Uh, IRV, IVRHA.org would be one place to start. Um, and, um, you know, I'd, I'd say a number of the early stage startups that are focusing on uh, mental health care are, are, are findable. Uh, I'll, I'll, if I have time before we end, I'll, I'll, post, a, I'll post a list. But uh, there, there's a lot of activity in this area. And it's really search forward with, uh, uh, with with all the investment money and, and acute need driven by COVID. Uh, when I talk to some of the large insurance groups, they talk about the second pandemic and they're not talking about uh, another virus. They're talking about the, the derivative mental health issues from the current pandemic. And so uh, I think this is gonna be a very growing area with some really exciting possibilities, but also uh, you know some things we have to be careful about and do right. Yeah, yeah. Um, to this, to that point, thank you for that. And to that point, so maybe I'll start with Matthew and then I'll ask everyone to please respond. So uh, Matthew and panelists, wh where do you see things heading in the next, say, 
couple of years. And that can be in terms of the field in general as it relates to games and uh, well-being um, and mitigating things like stress and burnout and potentially things such as PTSD. It can be in terms of your own work that you're focused on. So for example, Matthew, uh, is Eliza something that you've shipped and forgotten about? Or, I mean, I know you never really forget about your games, but is it is it something that still lives with inside you and you're always thinking about where it will be next? Um, and I would offer that to all of the speakers, sort of, you know, what's on the horizon in the next couple of years for you or um, our ecosystem? Sure, I think, um... I, I I would echo what what Walter just said, which is that this is a a really growing field right now. Um, there was there was tremendous interest in this kind of stuff um, even before uh, the pandemic. There was uh, in, in interest you know from entrepreneurs side, from the academic side, um, from the healthcare side. I think we've all recognized that it's a it's a growing category of 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 need and there've been a lot of global studies that have said um behavioral health and mental health are these are these underserved categories that we need to start addressing more and so i think if anything the pandemic has underscored the the need for this kind of stuff uh very urgently but the category was sort of growing anyway and so if it, this is probably a very safe prediction to make but i, I think as as just a like an industry, I think it will it will grow quite a bit, and as a result of that, many many more people will have experiences with like trying a chatbot for mental health or or doing telemedicine, you know, speaking with their therapist uh, over video. All of these kinds of things, uh, people who would have maybe done them five years in the future or 10 years in the future, they're doing them right now because they, they have yeah. to, right? And so people are getting more and more used to using these technologies. Um, like, again, like Walter said, things like Apple Watch are just making it normal that you would you would track your sleep or track your heart rate throughout the day. Um, it's becoming normalized for you to kind of like be collecting data on yourself and having that, that data to analyze later. I think to just quickly talk about what I'm personally interested in, I, I'm definitely still interested in the in the themes of of Eliza, um, and I want to continue to create interesting story games that kind of elucidate these these questions and, and problems. Okay, um, and I yeah I agree. I think it's um, an area that's going to grow, but I think that I think mental health. Um, has always been they always call it the Cinderella service of healthcare, um, where it's always been on the side and it's coming to the forefront because we see that mental health underpins every area of health. Um, but what I do think we're going to start to see is rather than it just being which what we do see is offline interventions like CBT put online. Um, I think people will be able to be a bit more creative with the interventions that they're creating online and think about more digital first based interventions as well and games that are driven by it rather than um, using what is um, obviously an uh, um, accredited approach um, online because actually what we're starting to see is there's other ways that people are interacting with games and with technology online and actually that's what we need to be creating tools that can respond to that. So I think that we're going to start to see a range and a diversity of interventions that are available digitally um, and people there'll be more of an appetite to invest in those but also use them um, and I think in addition to that um, what we now are able to do is not to just look at that one size fits all approach because there's this siloed way of looking at things we can look at how we provide individualized and community-based interventions for mental health digitally and um, that like Walter said are culturally and also socially adapted and so therefore can be um, adapted to work in different countries in different contexts and different environments and be able to get that rapid um, feedback to be able to change things um, in an ethical way so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm excited um, I'm excited that there's good people that are coming to work together as well because it it needs the developers it needs the clinicians it needs young people it needs parents it needs everybody working um, alongside each other able to provide their, their valued insight into um, what impacts all of us. Well, as for myself, gee, there's, there's so many 
important needs. Um, I'm very concerned about the fact that someone can make a phone call now. They finally decided to address their uh, their problem with uh, addiction or their problem with depression or anxiety. They make a phone call to get help, and they're said they're they're told, "We'll see you in three months. Uh, we just can't we can't get you in sooner." So, I th I think we must do something uh, better now, and I and we have the tools to do it. So for for myself, I'm. I'm trying to, to work with the ecosystem to accelerate the development of validated, well-designed, safe, secure, protecting privacy, but powerful, powerful things that can be available and not limited because we just don't have enough clinicians uh, to, to do it. We have to leverage technology. And um, so that, that's where I'm going to try and put my efforts is to try and uh, make sure people do it right and do it as fast as possible because we can't, can't afford to wait too much longer. And I'm so glad to have uh, my colleagues on, on this presentation who are, who are making that happen too. And, uh, and the people who are listening to this, to this uh, conversation are part of the ecosystem too. So, you know, we've, we've got a lot of work to do, but we can do it. Yes, uh, I, I echo that. We have a lot of work to do. We can do it. And it's interesting to see the way that um, the games games intersect so many different verticals. And, you know, when I started out in games, it was this niche career. Nobody cared. And now games are everywhere. And they always have been everywhere. But we're just seeing it sort of institutionalized at, at various points. And I'm so honored to be on this roundtable with all of you. And I really want to thank the audience. You've been awesome. And your contributions have really added to the conversation. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the festival. And, and thank you, speakers. <laughs>